All right, thank you, Beth, and thank you, Dr. Krishnan and Ray, for inviting me to speak with you today. My name is Alina Anaki, and I'm a nurse in the cath lab at Mount Sinai. First, I also want to say thank you for your patience. I know we're approaching the end of the day, so I will try to keep this short. And I'll talk to you today about nursing care and acute emergencies in the cath lab intra and post procedure. I have no re relevant financial relationships. So far, you've heard all about the different endovascular procedures we perform in Mount Sinai. You've heard about the different devices, balloons, and stents we have available. Now I'm going to talk to you about what our role as nurses is when things don't go according to plan during these procedures. Although um, proce these procedures are generally very safe and we at Mount Sinai pride ourselves on having a low complication rate, we must always be prepared for the worst case scenarios. The potential complications I'm referring to are the ones listed on this slide. Regarding CVA and hypotension, I will talk about these specifically related to carotid artery intervention. So arterial perforation. The use of minimally invasive endovascular procedures has increased, and as such, the frequency of associated vascular complications has also increased. Regardless of the access site, rarely arterial perforation can occur which can be fatal if it's not properly managed. Rapid recognition and endovascular management reduce the need for open surgical repair, therefore reduce the morbidity and mortalities of these complications. Patients with heavily calcified art vessels in addition to hypertension and diabetes are at an increased risk for perforation. So in the event that this occurs, the first step would be to balloon tamponade by placing a balloon across the defect and inflating to low pressure for two to four minutes. This is done by the interventionalist. Balloon tamponade stops the bleeding and allows for initiation of coagulation cascade to seal the perforation. So if this is insufficient, a self-expanding covered stent may be considered. Reversal of anticoagulation is commonly listed as treatment for perforations. However, anticoagulation should rarely be reversed during the intervention as this may lead to additional complications related to thrombosis. So anticoagulation is, received, or is achieved with either angiomax or heparin. So what is our role as nurses during this adverse event? The first step is recognition of the perforation. Our next step is hemodynamic stability and anticoagulation considerations. For angiomax, immediate discontinuation of the infusion is priority. In the event that anticoagulation reversal is deemed necessary, protamine can be given if heparin was used. Dosage can be anywhere for, from 10 to 50 milligram bolus, depending on the patient's weight, ACT, and the situation. Important reminders for the physician during this critical time is current ACT, anticoagulation used, and the last time and dose that it was administered. We're also ready to administer IV neosinephrine to keep systolic blood pressure above 90, as well as normal saline bolus. If the perforation is not contained with ballooning and a covered stent, we can prepare for possible blood administration. The nurse will call blood bank to ensure the blood bank that the blood is ready for the patient and is being sent to the cath lab. This is why it's very important to make sure that we have an active type in screen prior to any invasive procedure. And throughout all this, we are monitoring our patients' hemodynamics and provided, providing supportive care as needed. So our protocol at Mount Sinai is that patients with a history of contrast allergy are pre-medicated with three doses of prednisone starting at 13 hours prior to the procedure. The nurse will have assessed the patient for any allergies and will have made sure that these pre-medications were given. Then, IV solucortef and IV Benadryl are administered by the nurse prior to the start of the procedure. In the event that the patient has an unknown allergy to contrast and develops a reaction, the first step is recognizing that the patient is having an allergic reaction, whether it's mild to moderate or severe. Itching, skin rash, or hives is, are symptoms of a mild to moderate reaction for which the nurse can administer IV solucortef and Benadryl. If the patient is having an anaphylactic reaction, again, the first step is recognizing that. Then, based on the patient's hemodynamics, if the patient is severely hypotensive and is having difficulty breathing, the nurse will prepare to administer sub-Q or IM epinephrine, and then an epinephrine drip can be initiated if it's needed. 
If the patient continues to have difficulty breathing despite these interventions, airway management becomes a priority and anesthesia will be called. So next we'll talk about hypertension, hypotension, and bradycardia. With hypertension, the nurse will first identify the cause. If the patient is in pain and that's the reason for their increased blood pressure, the nurse can administer additional sedation. If the patient remains hypertensive despite being pain-free and comfortable, the nurse can administer IV antihypertensive medication such as IV hydralazine under the direction of the physician. I want to mention that it's important we are in constant communications with our doctors so we can ensure the safety of our patients. If the patient is still hypo hypertensive despite all this, the nurse can initiate nitroglycerin infusion for blood pressure management and continuously monitor the patient. Oftentimes during peripheral interventions, hypotension occurs during stent deployment in the carotid artery. The mechanism of sustained hypotension may be explained on the basis of the carotid sinus reflex arc. Balloon dilatation and the radial force of the self-expanding stent results in an increased radial pressure within the carotid sinus, leading to inappropriate activation of the baroreceptors and subsequent development of sustained hypotension. Again, the nurse must be aware of what is happening during the procedure and must be monitoring the patient during this critical time. During this type of procedure, it's very important to keep the systolic blood pressure above 140 in order to ensure that the brain is adequately perfused. Usually, the patient will be started on a neosinephrine drip if the blood, blood pressure is below that. If the patient becomes hypotensive despite that, the nurse can administer IV neosinephrine as well as IV um, fluids. Transient bradycardia is another common physiological response to balloon dilatation of the carotid lesions, particularly during post-dilatation stenting. These hemodynamic instabilities are effectively avoided by pretreatment with IV atropine or glycopyrrolate. Bradycardia can also occur during the inflation of the SFA arteries as well as with the inflation of the iliac arteries. This is usually due to a vagal response. So we already know the nurses are always monitoring the patient during the procedure and is ready to administer IV atropine or any emergency medications that are needed. So although rare during, during peripheral interventions, another emergency worth mentioning is stroke. It can occur at any time, however, extra attention should be given during carotid artery interventions. As you've seen, the carotid arteries are very close to the brain, so there's a risk of a piece of plaque becoming dislodged and traveling to the brain. This is more likely to occur during the post-procedure period, though. Regardless, prior to the procedure, the nurse will have done a baseline neurological assessment, and during the procedure, the patient will be monitored and assessed for any changes. If the nurse notices any signs or symptom, symptoms of a stroke, the physician will immediately be alerted and a stroke code will be activated. This means the procedure, procedure will be stopped and the patient will be taken to CAT scan per stroke code protocols. For sedation, we sedate our patients with fentanyl and Versed. In the event that the patient becomes minimally responsive or unresponsive and experiences respiratory depression, the nurse will recognize this as a potential effect of the sedation. The nurse will provide oxygen therapy and administer the reversal medications, which are Narcan and Flumazenil. If the patient remains unresponsive, loses a pulse, either after sedation or just at any time, ACLS protocol will be initiated. Okay, so now the procedure is done, everything went great, and we're ready to close up. At Mount Sinai, the closure devices most commonly used are Perclose, Proglide, and Angiosio. Perclose works by placing a suture at the puncture site, and this, unlike the other vascular closure devices, allow for immediate repuncturing of the artery at its site of its deployment. The angioseal device creates a mechanical seal by sandwiching the arteriotomy between a bioabsorbable anchor and collagen sponge, which dissolves in 60 to 90 days. So in this case, if reaccess is necessary within that time, it's recommended to be at least one centimeter from the previous site. Some of the complications that can occur with these devices are local bleeding, dissection, and arterial leg ischemia, to name a few. Persistent bleeding from the access site could be due to failure of the closure device. Manual pressure will be held, and once bleeding subsides and there is no evidence of a hematoma, the nurse will have a FEMSAP ready to apply. Depending on how much blood loss occurred, the nurse can check a CBC and, um, 
will always monitor hemodynamics and provide supportive care as needed. Another complication that can occur is dissection of the femoral artery while deploying the closure device. This is usually treated with balloon tamponade done by the physician. The nurse will monitor the patient's hemodynamics during this time and provide supportive care as needed. It's important to mention that baseline distal pulses would, will have been checked by the nurse prior to the start of the procedure and once again during closure device deployment and again after completion. If there's a change or loss in the pulse, the nurse will inform the physician immediately. The next step is to assess the affected extremity, which brings me to our next complication, arterial leg ischemia. This is due to an abrupt closure of the vessel. Although it, it's rare, it can occur following incorrect deployment of a clip-based device. Therefore, it's extremely important to assess the lower extremity and inform the physician immediately of any changes. The nurse will assess for pain, pallor, paralysis, and pulse deficit. If the patient is exhibiting any of these symptoms, standard of care would be for the physician to obtain contralateral access in order to confirm this injury by angiogram. Once it's confirmed, additional intervention will be performed to correct this. We're still monitoring our patient and providing supportive care as needed. So a few emergencies that can occur <laughs> post-procedure are CVA, bradycardia and hypotension, and vascular complications. As I've mentioned earlier, stroke is more likely to occur post-carotid artery intervention rather than during. This can be caused by pieces of plaque becoming dislodged at the time of the procedure and causing problems to the blood flow to the brain. Also, rarely, incre the increased blood flow to the brain can cause bleeding into the brain, which is often a much more devastating event. In the post-procedure area, the nurse will perform frequent neurological assessments, and if any symptoms of a stroke are noted, stroke code will be activated. Hypotension and bradycardia post-peripheral interventions are usually due to a vasovagal response, especially during a sheath pull. A sheath is left in place when a closure device is unable to be used. This can be due to calcified femoral arteries. The nurse practitioner or interventional fellows are the ones who usually perform the arterial sheath pulls. It's usually done two hours post-procedure. So the nurse will be at bedside during this time, frequently monitoring blood pressure and heart rate, and will have neosinephrine and atropine ready in case of a vasovagal event. The recovery nurse will frequently assess vital signs as I've mentioned, but also assess access site. Hematoma formation is the most common vascular complication post cath The nurse will notify the fellow immediately when an expanding hematoma is noted. Manual compression should be applied until there's no evidence of a hematoma expansion. Retroperitoneal bleed is an infrequent but potentially fatal complication of a peripheral angiogram performed using the transfemoral route. The post-recovery nurse will watch out for patients complaining of abdominal pain, abdominal distension, mass, or severe back and lower quadrant pain, and recognize that these symptoms might indicate a bleed. These symptoms will be reported to the physician immediately, and if they suspect a bleed, a CAT scan will also be done. A pseudoaneurysm occurs when a blood vessel wall is injured and the leaking blood collects in the surrounding tissues. The nurse will notice a lump or swelling at the access site and notify the physician immediately. Once a pseudoaneurysm is found, it can be treated with ultrasound-guided medication, so in this treatment, they use ultrasound imaging to locate and inject thrombin into the pseudoaneurysm, which causes the pooled blood to clot. For more severe cases, surgical repair may be needed. And as I've already mentioned, local bleeding can occur, and the interventions are the same, which is manual pressure until there's making sure there's no hematoma, then applying a femstop. So in conclusion, Pay attention, know what is going on with your procedure and your patient, always anticipate what can be wrong, what can go wrong, communicate with your physicians, react and intervene. Thank you.